Section 11. The French Revolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The French Revolution by Hilaire Belloc. Section 11. Chapter 4. Continued. Two days later, on the 19th of June, the National Assembly, still only self-styled and possessing only the powers which it had ascribed to itself beyond all forms of law, set to work, nominated its committees, and assumed the sovereignty thus claimed. The nobles protested, notably the bishops, and the king, on the advice of Barrington, keeper of the seals, determined upon immediate resistance. The excuse was taken that the royal session, as it was called, in which the king would declare his will, needed the preparation of the hall, and when the commons presented themselves at the door of that hall on the next day, the 20th, they found it shut against them. They adjourned to a neighboring tennis court, and took a solemn corporate oath that they would not separate without giving France a constitution. They continued to meet, using a church for that purpose, but on the 23rd, the royal session was opened, and the king declared his will. The reader must especially note that even in this crisis the crown did not offer a complete resistance. There was an attempt at compromise. Necker would have had a more or less complete surrender. The queen and her set would have preferred an act of authority which should have annulled all that the commons had done. What actually happened was a permission by the crown that the three orders should meet as one body for certain common interests, but should preserve the system of voting as separate houses in all that might regard the ancient and constitutional rights of the three orders, the constitution to be given to future parliaments, feudal property and the rights and prerogatives of the two senior houses. As a mere numerical test, such a conclusion would have destroyed the power of the commons since, as we have seen, numbers were the weapon of the commons, who were equal to the other two houses combined, and if all sat together, would, with the liberal members of the clergy and the nobility, be supreme. But apart from this numerical test, the act of sovereignty affirmed by the National Assembly when it declared itself, and itself only, competent to vote taxes, was annulled. Moreover, the royal declaration ended with a command that on the next day the three orders should meet separately. Now at this critical point the king was disobeyed. The current of the time chose the revolutionary bed, and as it began to flow, deepened and confirmed its course with every passing day and event. Already the majority of the clergy had joined the National Assembly when it had affirmed its right to sit in spite of the check of the 20th of June. There was a half-hour on that decisive day of the royal session, the 23rd of June, when armed forces might have been used for the arrest and dispersion of the deputies. They declared themselves inviolable and their arrest illegal, but there was of course no sanction for this decree. As a fact, not a corporal's file was used against them. The next day, the 24th, the majority of the clergy again joined the commons in their session in flat defiance of the king's orders and on the twenty fifth forty seven of the nobles followed their example the king yielded and on the twenty seventh two days later ordered the three houses to meet together the national assembly was now legally constituted and set out upon its career the crown the old centre of authority had abandoned its position and had confirmed the revolution but in doing so it had acted as it were in contradiction with itself it had made technically legal an illegality which destroyed its own old legal position but it had done so with ill will and it was evident that some counterstroke would be attempted to restore the full powers of the crown at this point the reader must appreciate what forces were face to face in the coming struggle so far the illegal and revolutionary act of the 17th of June, the royal session which replied to that act upon the 23rd, the king's decree which yielded to the commons upon the 27th, had all of them been but words. If it came to action, 
what physical forces were opposed. On the side of the crown was the organized armed force which it commanded, for it must never be forgotten that the crown was the executive, and remained the executive right on to the capture of the palace three years later, and the consummation of the revolution on the 10th of August in 1792. On the side of the National Assembly was, without doubt, the public opinion of the country, but that is not a force that can be used under arms. And what was much more to the point, the municipal organization of France. Space forbids a full description of the origins and strength of the French municipal system. It is enough to point out that the whole of Gallic civilization, probably from a moment earlier than Caesar's invasion, and certainly from the moment when Roman rule was paramount in Gaul, was a municipal one. It is still so. The countrysides take their names mainly from the chief towns. The towns were the seats of the bishops, whose hierarchy had preserved whatever could be preserved of the ancient world. In the towns were the colleges, the guilds, the discussion, and the corporations, which built up the life of the nation. The chief of these towns was Paris. The old systems of municipal government, corrupt and varied as they were, could still give the towns a power of corporate expression and even where that might be lacking it was certain that some engine would be found for expressing municipal action in a crisis of the sort through which france was now passing in paris for instance it was seen when the time came for physical force that the college of electors who had chosen the representatives for that city were willing to act at once and spontaneously as a municipal body which should express the initiative of the people it was the towns and especially Paris, prompt at spontaneous organization, ready to arm, and when armed, competent to frame a fighting force, which was the physical power, behind the assembly. What of the physical power behind the king? His power was, as we have said, the regular armed forces of the country, the army. But it is characteristic of the moment that only a part of that armed force could be trusted. For an army is never a mere weapon, it consists of living men, and though it will act against the general opinion of its members, and will obey orders long after civilians would have broken with the ties of technical and legal authority, yet there is for armies also a breaking point in those ties, and the crown, I repeat, could not use as a whole the French-speaking and French-born soldiery. Luckily for it, a very great proportion of the French army at that moment consisted of foreign mercenaries. Since the position was virtually one of war, we must consider what was the strategical object of this force. Its object was Paris, the chief of the towns, and round Paris in the early days of July the mercenary regiments were gathered from all quarters. That military concentration once effected, the gates of the city held, especially upon the north and upon the west, by encamped regiments and by a particularly large force of cavalry, ever the arm chosen for the repression of civilians. The crown was ready to act. On the 11th of July, Necker, who stood for liberal opinions, was dismissed. A new ministry was formed, and the counter-revolution begun. What followed was the immediate rising of Paris. The news of Necker's dismissal reached the masses of the capital, only an hour's ride from Versailles, on the afternoon of the 12th, Sunday. Crowds began to gather. An ineffectual cavalry charge in one of the outer open spaces of the city only inflamed the popular enthusiasm, for the soldiers who charged were German mercenary soldiers, under the command of a noble. Public forces were at once organized. Arms were commandeered from the armorer's shops. The electoral college, which had chosen the members of the assembly for Paris, took command at the guild hall. But the capital point of the insurrection, what made it possible, was the seizure of a great stock of arms and ammunition, including cannon. It was in the depot at Invalides. With such resources, the crowd attacked at the other end of the city a fortress and an arsenal, which had long stood in the popular eye as the symbol of absolute monarchy, the Bastille. With the absurdly insufficient garrison of the Bastille, 
its apparent impregnability to anything the mob might attempt, the supposed but doubtful treason of its governor in firing upon those whom he admitted to parley, we are not here concerned. The Bastille was rushed after very considerable efforts and an appreciable loss in killed and wounded. By the evening of that day, Tuesday, the 14th of July, 1789, Paris had become a formidable instrument of war. The next news was the complete capitulation of the king. He came on the morrow to the National Assembly, promising to send away the troops. He promised to recall Necker. A municipal organization was granted to the city, with Bailey for its first mayor, and a point of capital importance, an armed militia, dependent upon that municipality, was legally formed, with Lafayette at its head. On the 17th, Louis entered Paris to consummate his capitulation, went to the Guild Hall, appeared in the tricolored cockade, and the popular battle was won. It behooves us here to consider the military aspect of this definitive act from which the sanction of the revolution, the physical power behind it, dates. Paris numbered somewhat under a million souls, perhaps no more than six hundred thousand. The number fluctuated with the season. The foreign mercenary troops, who were mainly employed in the repression of the popular feeling therein, were not sufficient to impose anything like a siege. They could, at the various gates, have stopped the provisioning of the city, but then, at any one of those separate points, any one of their detachments, upon a long perimeter, more than a day's march in circumference, would certainly have been attacked, and almost as certainly overwhelmed, by masses of partially armed civilians. Could the streets have been cleared while the ferment was rising? It's very doubtful. They were narrow and tortuous in the extreme, the area to be dealt with was enormous, the tradition of barricades not forgotten, and the spontaneous action of that excellent fighting material which a Paris mob contains had been quite as rapid as anything that could have been effected by military orders. The one great fault was a neglect to cover the Invalides. But even had the Invalides not been looted, the stock of arms and powder in the city would have been sufficient to have organized a desperate and prolonged resistance. The local auxiliary force of slight military value, it is true, the French guards, as they were called, were wholly with the people, and in general the crown must be acquitted of any considerable blunder on the military side of this struggle. It certainly did not fail from lack of will. The truth is, if we consider merely the military aspect of this military event, that in dealing with large bodies of men who are a. Not previously disarmed, b. Under conditions where they cannot be dispersed, and c. Capable, by a national tradition or character, of some sort of rapid, spontaneous organization, the issue will always be doubtful, and the uncertain factor, which is the tenacity, decision, and common will of the civilians to which soldiers are to be opposed, is one that varies within the very widest limits. In massing the troops originally, the Crown and its advisers estimated that uncertain factor at far too low a point. Even contemporary educated opinion, which was in sympathy with Paris, put it too low. That factor was, as a fact, so high that no armed force of the size and quality which the Crown then disposed of could achieve its object or hold down the capital. As for the absurd conception that any body of men in uniform, however small, could always have the better of civilian resistance, however large and well organized, it is not worthy of a moment's consideration by those who interest themselves in the realities of military history. It is worthy only of the academies. So ends the first phase of the revolution. It had lasted from the opening of the States General in May to the middle of July in 1789. The end of section 11.